Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the beneficent, the merciful, the one God to whom all holy praise is due forever because we have come to know him as he is. And he found it fit to reveal himself to a people who were considered to be no people at all. But upon the hearts and the minds and the spirit of babes, he hath revealed the great wisdom of all time, the reality of God. And for this great message and revelation coming from God Almighty to the black man and the black woman of America since 1930, we carry the great weight and the burden now to take this message to those who are in our communities, to our downtrodden people who are suffering night and day by the brutal behavior and the brutal acts of criminal actions against our people throughout America and throughout the world. We are a very special people. We are a very blessed people. And the more and more that you live to understand the beauty and the power of Islam as taught to us by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and know that Minister Louis Farrakhan is continuing this great message and this great teaching up until the moment that God Almighty puts up his hand and says, that's enough, stop. There is an angel that stands up in the 10th chapter of Revelation. And he points his hands up into the heavens. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that that angel is holding his hands in the position of prayer. And he is praying to the Almighty God Allah, knowing that the time that we have known, we shall know no more. And immediately after that angel spoke, we move into the 11th chapter of Revelation. And we see there the image of the continuation of this prophetic picture of one who takes a rod and a pen and they begin to measure the sanctuary and they begin to measure the environment and the surroundings around the sanctuary. And in that hour of that measuring, and in that hour of the revelation that is given, we find that there is a death plot against two witnesses that rose up before God to witness to the people and to the world. But the enemy became angry and they said to all of their hosts of demons, let us go down quickly and stop the witnessing of those two witnesses who stand before the tabernacle of God Almighty, giving to the people the measurement of the time of the judgment and the hour that is upon us. And we bear witness that these two witnesses have gone about doing their work. And one, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was taken away. And the other is remaining for just a little while longer. I wanted to preface what I intend to say to you this afternoon with a description of the judgment that we are in today. And 
the subject that I have chosen to share with you comes from many months of preparation, of studying the signs and the hands of Almighty God Allah in the heavens above, as reflected in the earth below. And that is affecting all of the events, the major and the minor, the seen and the unseen hand of God working from people to people, from nation to nation, from kingdom to kingdom. So that ultimately, as the Holy Quran tells us, that he will show us signs in the farthest places and in the nearest places until we cannot deny that God Almighty is working in this hour in person himself. Where does that leave you and I? We will not hear this message coming from this mosque, Maryam, in Chicago, Illinois, coming from any representative of the United States government. We will not be privileged to hear this message that has been pounding in our ears for over a half century from the foundation and the founding of the nation of Islam in Detroit, Michigan in 1930, now entering into 61 years. How long will the time go on that words will be given into the ears of our people that we may awaken to understand that God has chosen this community, the black man, the black woman, the black people of America to sound this message. How long do you think that we have to continue? I too want to pay honor and respect to the passing of my grandmother as I remember the words of Minister Louis Farrakhan in Detroit, Michigan, 1990 in Cobo Hall when he honored his wife Sister Khadija Muhammad, and then graciously honored myself, and then honored the greatest of us, my grandmother who lived to reach the age of 97 years old. So when she passed, I must tell you what I was told, because in her passing, there are lessons out of which we will gain knowledge, be nourished, and be able to grow into a dark period that is casting its shadow upon this land of America and throughout the world. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said to me when he learned of my grandmother's passing, she was a righteous woman because the way that you told me that she passed indicates that she died the death of a Muslim. Now let us understand. All of her background and surroundings was Christian like you and I, raised in the church, whether Methodist, Congregational, or Baptist, or whatever. We were reared in a certain kind of atmosphere. But what makes you a Muslim? Not a title that you call yourself a Muslim, but a Muslim is a kind of spirit that is in the very nature of the very spirit, the heart, the soul, the flesh, the bones, the blood, the thoughts, the cells of every black man and woman, whether you call yourselves a Muslim or a Christian. And a Muslim is one who has submitted his will or her will to the will of Almighty God, Allah, so that we can say as the Quran states, die not unless you are a Muslim. Now let us understand what I mean in respect 
to the passing of my grandmother. We know that the main subject that I want to touch upon, because that is all that I'm able to do, is to touch upon the significance and the meaning of this total solar eclipse that we are about to experience in a few short days. I was in Mexico when I learned the news. And I was really taken aback because I had prayed that Granny would live through another year. Her birthday would fall only three months from now, on October the 11th, 1991. July the 11th, exactly the day of the eclipse. So I thought in my mind, the significance of an eclipse is so vast. And once we begin to go into the astronomical and the mathematical information that has accumulated and has been published and has been revealed from both ancient sources and modern scientific exploration and study, we will come to understand exactly what I mean. An eclipse is the hiding or the veiling of an object by another object which leaves us in a state of darkness. Darkness and oftentimes confusion and actually danger. Because in that darkness, believe it or not, the light itself is so powerful that if you look at the eclipse of the sun, it could ruin permanently the retina of the eye and cause permanent blindness. That is how powerful the light is that is even hidden in the darkness. So what do we say about the light that shines forth in the midday sun? So the eclipsing and the passing of my grandmother just prior to this event caused me to focus back to 1975. And with the departure and the leaving of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, there was a sign that was given to us. It was the sign that is spoken of in the 75th surah of the Holy Quran called the resurrection. That in death there is life. That in darkness there is light. There is guidance for those who will but understand and focus on that light to get understanding. In the 75th surah, which is, by the way, the manner in which Allah guided me into the knowledge of the number 19 without its full, how would you say, understanding. I was reading in the Holy Quran in Oakland, California, in 1978. And as I read the verses, it said, and when the sun and the moon come together, producing darkness and confusion, it says, take refuge in Allah. He is the only source of light, the only source of sustenance, the only source of strength to carry us through such darkness. So with the coming together of the sun and the moon, it is also the sign of an eclipse. Though an eclipse did not actually take place physically, but an eclipse on the spiritual level took place in 1975 because the moon no longer gave its light, nor did the sun give its light, but they were closed 
together as one light in the darkness and he found peace with his Lord and he went and he made that journey and we'll talk about that journey another time so that I don't lose the whole total scope of what I want to share in this brief hour so with the passing of my grandmother which occurred on June 29th on a Saturday it was exactly 13 days prior to this solar eclipse. And when I was told the manner in which she passed, I wanted to be like the Christian and shout hallelujah. Because I could see in her life a mirror of what I would like to live to see in my own lifetime. And that I would hope that we would live to see and experience in our own lifetime. She was weakening in her age, and she was not able to do the things for herself that she was used to doing. She needed care almost 24 hours a day in these last year since 1990. And in the moments that she decided that she wanted to go, she asked those who were in attendance to put her in a chair and let her sit there quietly and not to call an ambulance and not to call the doctor because she felt that death was coming on. And she sat there according to the witnesses who testified to this before me that she sat there and she called the names of those that were close to her. And as she called the names of those who were close to her, she did not even want them to know that the hand of death was upon her because she was exhibiting the same strength in death that she exhibited in life, an independence and a strength and a courage and knowing that she was going back to her Lord and they said she began to pray and she prayed from that psalm though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I fear no evil and then they said she looked around the room as her eyes began to get weak put her hands on the side of the comforter chair and she dropped her head and she was no more in a sleep. And she asked them not to even have the doctors to revive her because she said, my time has come. And this is the way that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the righteous would die, that they would go into a sleep. And that is the way that she was taken. So I give praise to Almighty God Allah for the strength of my grandmother and I thank Minister Louis Farrakhan who saw the beauty of her and wanted to share that with thousands and thousands of Muslims from around the world in the city of Detroit, Michigan where the Nation of Islam was founded in 1930. And to go a step further to hear and to see a son born from my loins, from my womb, to stand and carry on an aspect of the feeling and the spirit of his father, to be able to take a room of Christians and Muslims and have and hear the pastor say what you heard my son say, and in addition say, when I retire, I think I want to be one of those Muhammads. That's what he said. <laughs> so it was a wonderful, wonderful funeral. How can you say that a funeral was wonderful? But it was a peaceful journey that I will reflect upon all the days of my life for having had 
such precious sweet hours with a grandmother like my grandmother that I wish that many of you had come to know. So thank you for listening to those brief words that I wanted to give as a special tribute to my mother and my grandmother. And as Minister Farrakhan said, she's not only my grandmother referring to me, but he is, she is the grandmother of us all. Thank you. To deal now with some of the scientific information about this major event that is getting ready to happen on Thursday of this week, it is important and necessary to review an aspect of the Holy Quran because the Holy Quran is really the root of this message. The Holy Quran is the root of Islam and is the root of a true believer and is the root of Muslims. The 90th surah, if I may open for a moment, is called al balad In English, it is translated the city, containing 20 verses. Now, according to Surah 90, the city that is referred to here is Mecca, the holy city of Mecca. And if we look back to the events of 1990, we will find that indeed Mecca <clears throat> as a city and the Arabs as a people who are considered to be the guardians of the holy and sacred places in both Mecca and Medina, that they have been shaken with a great shaking. When suddenly, after Hajj, after the holy month of pilgrimage, in which last year the terrible death toll of 1,400 people. Pay attention to the numbers, pay attention to the events. Perished, suffocated in a tunnel leading from the city into the main cubicle square or center of the Kaaba. Perished because the air conditioning unit that is usually functioning, stopped. 1,400 people perished. On August the 2nd, I was trying to remember where I was. I was doing research on UFO in the country of Peru. And I was accompanied by my son to the city which is called in the ancient kingdom of the Incas, which is the trail of the Incas from Cusco into the Andes mountains, into the old ruins called Machu Picchu, which means the big mountain, and beside it is the little mountain, which represents part of the Inca Indian culture of South America or of that particular part of South America. It was exactly on August the 2nd when Saddam Hussein made his move into Kuwait. And we know the rest of the story. Within months, with fiery diplomatic and political back and forth going, the decision was made by the Bush administration to retaliate for Saddam Hussein's move into Kuwait. On January the 15th, he made that move. Now, never in the history of the Arabian Peninsula 
has the holy places been so threatened and the holy people, question mark, been so threatened by the amassing of military troops around a holy city like troops gathered around the holy city of Jerusalem in Palestine. Right now, today, there are still remaining troops, even though the victory marches and the parades and all of the fanfare of victory for a military victory over Saddam Hussein. But Minister Louis Farrakhan, in his press conference on his return from visiting Iraq and trying to offer a solution that could have profited both leaders, Bush in the White House and Saddam Hussein in Baghdad. But because the die is set, and the messenger said that you cannot make liars out of those fellows, and he was referring to the prophets. When a prophecy is given, it is written 25,000 years in advance of its actual fulfillment. So when it comes time for such and such part to take place, then God said that he reveals that part to a servant who is oft called a messenger or a prophet. Now, what do you think of Minister Parakan? Does he come up to the standard of one of those fellows? Did he not meet with that great one, Elijah Muhammad? In 1985, September the 17th, in one of those wheels that the government is studying so ferociously right now to try to keep a secret from the public. And at this very moment here in Chicago, the MUFON UFO organization is holding their final day session talking about encounters with these phenomenal wheels. And not just sightings now, seeing a flash of light and then some color and then something hovering over a bush. But they're actually talking and discussing about an imminent confrontation between what represents those wheels and what is on those wheels with the American public. This is how close things are and the time that is upon us. And there is nothing as you will bear witness that you will not read in the newspapers, read in a magazine, hear on the television, hear on the radio that is not a confirmation of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that we have heard for over 50 years. So if we are in the dark, we chose the dark rather than the light. As we continue to unfold the drama that is taking place in the East, we know that as a result of war, some 600 oil wells are on fire in the Kuwaiti desert. Is that right? And that it is estimated that it will take some five years to put those fires out. What will happen to the atmosphere in five years? Already in the short span of time that those fires were lit on January the 26th, on their way out, it created an atmospheric cloud that has produced acid rain that has contaminated the lungs of little children and of little babies in producing lesions and skin diseases that they're not reporting in the news on a daily basis, darkening the cloud, darkening the ability of the light to shine for two weeks at a time. And with this acid rain not just falling on Kuwait, but affecting Iran, affecting Turkey, and then keep on going. And this acid rain has caused pollutants to accumulate to produce snow that is black snow 
in the Himalaya mountains and in India, then whipping up cyclones and furious winds of monsoon dimensions blowing in once and then twice into Bangladesh. People falling out from extreme heat wave affecting the people of Pakistan. And then within the midst of these ecological disasters and as the USA News and World Report said that this mushrooming cloud was an ecological Armageddon. So when Minister Louis Farrakhan said that if imploring these two leaders, 10% bloodsuckers of the poor, imploring them not to take that military move because it would open up a Pandora's box, it would open up the beginnings and the end of Armageddon. And just at the moment that they're celebrating in the parades and in the marches, celebrating the troops on their victory, now, lo and behold, they turn around and they're talking of another possible military strike. Like Eddie Kruger. What is that, Kruger? You know, I'm back. I mean, I don't know. But... <laughs> And as we go along, the wing of this fire that is brewing over in the Middle East, we find that political turmoil is also a part of the ecological upheaval. They go hand in hand. And there in India, we have the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi, the son of his mother, who was also assassinated in India, that subcontinent of unrest that has been seething ever since the partition of India and Pakistan and then the Sikhs and all of the other religious communities. All of these religious communities that are calling themselves holier than thou and I'm better than thee, but yet they're dropping out by famines and droughts and hunger and disasters coming on all sides. But yet they don't recognize the hand of God working in their midst. There was a man who was assassinated January 31st, 1990, because he dared to warn his own Arab brothers that they were headed for a divine chastisement. And he didn't just say it out of emotionalism, but he proved it by the same Quran in Arabic language that they read. And I'm referring to the scholar who was born in Tanta, Egypt, who came to America and Allah unfolded to him a part of the secret coding of the Holy Quran, which produced the study of the number 19. I'm referring to Dr. Rashad Khalifa. And just to get you into the understanding of what is going on, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that after me will come angels and scientists and people who are well learned and scholars and they will be continuing to unfold this drama of the prophetic cycle that's bringing in the end of this civilization that we have known. He said, according to Surah 44, which is called the drought, that there was a cloud that, that would be produced because of the striking on the earth of what they call an asteroid. You're familiar with what an asteroid is. These asteroids are rocks that perhaps have been dislodged from an orbiting body thrown off from a planet so that they call them minor planets. And their field of orbit is between Jupiter, the first of the large outer planets, and they come back and forth in and out of the outer planets into the inner terrestrial planets, which is Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. He said, according to what he could calculate, not that he was perfect, but according to what he 
could calculate, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the scholars have it just about right. But he had it 100% right. He said that total, I'm reading, I'm quoting, total devastation will envelop the Arab world. Okay? He says the Quranic prophecy in Surah 44, verses 10 through 15 will come to pass. A giant dust cloud will envelop the whole world and obscure the sun for a few months. Now, when this cloud was produced as a result of the petroleum being put on fire, it not only affected that area, but there was little minor reports in various magazines, though it wasn't given the full-blown news media coverage, that this blanketing cloud caused the temperature in other parts of the world to heat up, which is increasing the greenhouse effect, so that we begin breathing in carbon dioxide, yeah? Not getting fresh air from plants and trees and green. And it said that some aspects of this ecological or dust cloud, and they even called it a cloud of death, had sprayed out across the Pacific. And they were able to register a distortion in the atmosphere as far away as the Hawaiian Islands. Okay? In addition, the ecological disaster of the oil spills, which they estimated, listen to these numbers, estimated to be 200 million gallons pouring out and destroying the beautiful beaches along the Persian Gulf area in the Arabian Emirates. Now why am I going into all of this? Because we have to connect what is going on in the world today with the prophetic teachings of the prophets and the messengers because we have come to the end of the time that we have known. And in these 90 through 99 years, I mean not years, but decade, this next nine years is the great tribulation period. And things are going to escalate and escalate. According to Luke, according to John, according to those apostles of Jesus, according to the New Testament writings, when they asked Jesus to tell them the signs that would come, he went on to tell them that nation would rise up against nation, right? Kingdom against kingdom. That there would be earthquakes and there would be destructions and famines and, and disasters and pestilences would be everywhere. And then they pointed to another sign that the sun would no longer give her light and the moon would become like blood. And then before even those signs, tribulation and persecution would arise upon the righteous. And they would try to take us before tribunals and before courts for my name's sake. But lucky are ye who hold on to the end. Because after the darkening of the sun and the blood color of the moon given scripturally, symbolically, symbolic of something here, then the people would look up and they would see the sign of God <coughs> in the heavens above. You notice, brothers and sisters, that if you look at these numbers, 90 through 99, and you call the year 1990, 1991, 92, 93, just keep on going all the way down, the center numbers going straight down the center is 99. Is that right? And the 99th surah, <coughs> of the Holy Quran is called the shaking. 
when the earth is shaken with a great shaking and the earth brings forth a burden and man says what has befallen her it is as if the earth herself is beginning to reveal or to bring forth revelation and the earth itself is a sign of mother earth and in the abuse of the earth and the ecological disasters is a sign of the abuse to the woman is a sign of the abuse to women and to children to the widows and to the orphans to the single woman and the married woman all that we are seeing of the crimes and the pollutions and the attacks and the rapes of women and child molestations and incest murder <coughs> all of this is a sign of the ending of the time. So what do we have to do as we see these events unfold? We have to do like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said personally to me and to us as a family, as a community. Take refuge in Almighty God Allah. Don't take refuge in another human being because the Bible says two of you will be walking. One will be taken one will be left and I don't know why the Bible says two men will be in a bed <laughs> one man will be taken and the other one will be left <laughs> so what we're looking at brothers and sisters is the consummation and the ending of a period of time that we shall know no more but it is going to become increasingly more and more difficult to make it through that soon this mosque which should be filled to the rafters that should be filled all the way to the back but maybe it was too hot to come out today maybe that good movie that good game was on television and I didn't want to take the time to come out because they didn't know that mosque Miriam is a savior for our people they didn't know that Minister Louis Farrakhan has a limited period of time before God says, that's enough. And he's already easing us into that knowledge. Is that right? In just a short period of time. So we've got to wake up. And let me tell you something. If we don't learn to love one another, we're going to eat each other up before this thing is over. Right after the 90th surah, which speaks of the city. And now you see what has happened to the city. You notice that there were 20 verses in surah 90. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that before the end or the destruction of a civilization that God is about to remove from the planet Earth, he gives them 20 years at the end to wrestle with the judgment. They have a chance to do something and come clean or they'll go straight down into hell. 20 miles outside of the holy city of Mecca, there is a sign. Everyone dresses in the ihram dress at that point and there are station marks along the route. And at the 20 mile mark it says no non-believers beyond this point we know as Muslim followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that according to the history of Yaqub he was born 20 miles from the holy city of Mecca and he was born to bring in an enemy to the black nation and this enemy would work for 6,000 years and then at the end of the time which we are approaching the end of what they call the last millennium of the 6,000 years that we are in the very last nine years of the 20 years that was given 
to Yakub civilization, that is the Caucasian, the white race out of Europe. And all you have to do is look at where they came out of the caves and hillsides of Europe and look what is happening today in the Slavic nations, in the Baltic nations, in the Balkan nations, <laughs> Eastern Europe, Western Europe, the destruction of the Berlin Wall was a setup. It was a setup for revolution. So everyone again rejoiced. The wall, the wall is down. Now we've got Yugoslavia. Can you imagine? Two ethnic groups inside of a little strip of land declaring their independence. We've got Tatars. Do you know who Tatars are? That goes way back to like Genghis Khan, the Mongolians. You look, pick up the newspaper and we're learning geography without going to school. <laughs> the map showing you little places you never heard of before. It really began several years ago. If you remember, there was a great earthquake in Armenia. And with this great earthquake, there was that again, the accompanying political turmoil. And this political turmoil had warring together the Christian Armenians and the Muslim Azerbaijanis. Is that right? And that was in the Caucasus area. Is that right? All right. That's where a branch of the Caucasian race was hidden when they were sent out of Arabia for causing trouble there over 6,000 years ago. So some of them were hidden away. So these Kurds that you're reading about, all of these nations that are fighting for their independence. It is all right for the Bush administration to say in one breath, I will not recognize their independence. And then in the next breath said, well, if we can sit and moderate it, you can have a peaceful agreement, then we can accept your independence. But let the black man numbering 35 million say we want autonomy we want a piece of this land that we can call our own let us have a few of these states that we have fought for and blood given our blood for then they say huh what is that that's just a nigger <laughs> but before it's over god is going to put the heat on so strong that we're going to be running from his filthy society. That's why he doesn't want us in his society. But as long as he can make us sick with his food, sick with his drugs, sick with his doctors, not well, sick, then he can say, okay, we can wipe them out that way with subtleties put something out there in our water, drinking water, so that if you drink, you wonder what's wrong with you. And he's contaminated the water, contaminating the food. Oh, brothers and sisters, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. And I pray to God that he will open up our hearts and our minds and don't look at us because we are Muslims and say, oh, I don't want to have nothing to do with those Muslims. Don't do that. You one of those Muslims. Yes, things are bad, very, very bad. And if you keep moving along that eastern part of the world and get over into Southeast Asia, I didn't want to miss a point. I mentioned the 200 million gallons of water or oil that was spilled in the Persian Gulf. If you review the book of Revelation, you will find that each time you hit the number six, sixth trumpet, sixth bowl judgment, or the six vials, and you keep going, and every time you hit six, you run into these angels who are standing on the river Euphrates, which is right over there in Iraq, in the east, trying to hold back the winds of war until they could seal a certain number of devotees, of believers in Christ or Jesus as the 
Bible has it, sealing them in the head with the name of their father. Now listen to this. If you say, God is my father. Now listen to this. If you say, God is my father. And the Hindu says, God is my father. And the Buddhist says, God is my father. And the Hebrew says, God is my father. And the Muslim says, God is my father. Then something has to distinguish what God you're calling on. Is that right? So you've got to know the name of God in order to be saved. And that is the basis of the message that we preach from the mosques throughout America under the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We bring you the name of God so that if you call on him, we will be saved from the overriding chastisement that is coming upon this land. So 200 million, did you know that that is exactly the number that is given to the name of an army that is mobilizing its forces in the East? And they call it, according to the Christian theology, an Oriental army that will move in and take advantage of the situation. What is the problem that is taking place today? Bush is calling for trade with China. Is that right? But yet China is supplying underhand arms to Syria and parts to Saddam Hussein. Okay? So there you've got this Gila monster talking out of two sides of his face. And that's what he did in Iran with that guns and hostage situation that they now want to investigate going all the way back to the Reagan administration. So you just keep on pulling on that sewer, you know what I mean? And it's so deep you can't get all that garbage out. And we don't have time to be dealing in their world. We need to unite. We need to love one another and say, how can we save our communities? How can we save our people? Do you have water supply in your homes if all of a sudden you can't go out or the water main is broke? Do you have some other artificial mean of producing heat besides electricity if all of a sudden the electricity goes out? Do we have a way of protecting our families in their homes, our children, when things start getting rough fur? They're already rough, but rough fur? According to the prophecy, an army, an Oriental army coming out of that part of the world, numbering 200 million exactly corresponding to the number of gallons of oil that was spilled into the Persian Gulf. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wrote an article and put it on the front page of the Muhammad Speaks. He said, when the rivers of the Euphrates are dried up making way for the entrance of the kings of the East. Now you throw into that equation Japan. Japan is warring against America in a very political and shrewd, intelligent way. She said, okay, you dropped your bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We're gonna clean up now on the economic front. So everything in America now is challenging everything American made. And they wanna put a quota on what they can import and bring into this country from automobiles to every other kind of merchandise. And then you have Taiwan not far behind and Korea and all of the Eastern world now is moving in to take their place in the prophetic cycle before the end of time. 
And these things are not like happening long sweeps of time. They're happening instantly at once, one right after the other. So again, going further east, out into the South Pacific, we run into the Philippine Islands. And I'm not going to say, but just a little bit about that. The volcanic eruptions happening in Pinatubo wiped out and forced the evacuation of the military that was there. Subic Bay and Clark, is that right? Forced them to get out because they were then, they were trying to contemplate how they could remain, is that right? But a natural disaster that didn't come from a spook, but came from a true and living God, his hand is moving. He said, I will gather them up out of the places where they have hid and I will force them to go back to the places where they were originated. Is that right? right. And this is what is happening. We can't do it. God has to do it. So that's why he says, hang on to me, not to anybody else. Take refuge in me, not in anybody else. Now, I want to wrap this up because I don't want to go too long with you because I think that about an hour is sufficient. What do you think? 60 minutes is a good number. It took 60,000 <laughs> to make a new world. <laughs> but we want to remake the world that Yakub made. And we want, if it's just a handful, you're a precious handful that God inspired to come to Mas Maryam today. You're blessed. Because when you leave out of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you won't just be able to sit down. Those words will just keep working on your head, moving through your blood, <laughs> getting your brain cells to be revived. And that's what the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is to resurrect our people, to bring them back into the knowledge of their greatness and their heritage. Now I want to share with you a few astronomical facts about this eclipse. Number one, I think I will give just a brief description of what a solar eclipse actually is. In the, again, it's traced back to the Chaldeans who were the old Babylonian astrologers and astronomers of the ancient Babylonian civilization. They had been watching the cycles of the stars, of the moon, of the sun, as well as many other ancient people all over the world, including the Egyptians, including the people in Central Africa and in West Africa and East Africa, all the way over to Mesoamerica, Latin America, Mexico, Central America. The ancients have always studied the stars and their movements because they knew, because they were closer to divine than we are today, that in the movements and the cycles of the stars and the sun and the moon and the planets, that time was marking events that would take place. So in or from the Babylonian language comes the word saros, S-A-R-O-S, which means repetition. Repetition of an event that happens in the heavens after so many and so many years. So approximately every 19 years, the sun, the moon, and the earth are in what they call a perfect alignment or a straight line like that. And when you have a solar eclipse, we are the earth, is that right? Looking up into the heavens, what will happen on July 11 is that the sun will be in perihelion. That means it's the farthest distance away from the earth during the summer months. It's closer to the earth in the winter. 
So what will happen, because this is the precise number of years that have been calculated for this particular alignment to take place, the moon will move in front of the sun and it will act like a mask or a veil over the sun. And a shadow, which is called an umbra, which looks almost like a finger, will designate a specific part of the earth over which its shadow will be cast. This particular shadow of the moon that will be cast touches upon, in the beginning, sunrise. About 6.35 in the morning, it will hit the island of Ilo, or the capital of Ilo on the big island of Hawaii. And as it moves through, they will have a total eclipse for approximately four minutes. As the shadow continues to sweep down in the West Pacific Ocean, it will begin to clock time from 5,000 to 5,600 miles per hour, traveling straight for Baja California, which is the lower part of California, which is Mexico. And it will hit the capital of Paz, P-A-Z, peace, meaning peace, in Baja California. By the time it travels, which is approximately 2,200 miles that it takes from the beginning shadow of that eclipse to move from Hawaii into Baja California, 2,200 miles. Those figures should mean something to those who have been studying the history of Yakub civilization because they had to walk 2,200 miles in order to arrive into the caves and hillsides of Europe. Now, after it hits Paz, Baja California, it will continue to work its way through a little crevice that now begins to expand. This is the shadow I'm talking about. It will begin to expand in miles, about 160 miles in width. And if you were to look at a map, you would see the Hawaiian Islands, you would see North America and Canada, and you would see this little band of a shadow that moves like this, like an arc, exactly the way it looks, like an arc. And after it moves into Baja California, it will continue to move along the Pacific side of Mexico until it hits a little place called Tuxpan, which is in the state of Nayarit, and then Jalisco, Guadalajara, and then it will continue to move until it sweeps into Mexico City, the capital, and into the Valley of Mexico, and then into other states like Taxcuala, and then into Morelos, Morelia, into Oaxaca, and then into the state of Chiapas, which is going south now, and it will not pass by the Yucatan Peninsula, which if you look at a map of Mexico, it sort of looks like a dog, actually, like a boxer. And the dog's face is sitting out into what they call the area Cancun and the Caribbean part of the Atlantic Ocean. And then it will move into San Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and then move into Colombia in South America and hit finally by sun set, from sunrise to sunset, finally into Brazil. And it will hit into the Amazon region, and that will be the end of the last, what they call, total eclipse of this magnitude, because it will have a duration when it hits Mexico of nearly seven minutes. And the, the longest that a solar eclipse can endure, that is the whole length of studies of solar eclipse, is about 7 minutes and 31 seconds. So by the time this eclipse hits into Mexico, into the area of Baja California, Tuxpan, it will be 6 minutes and 58 
seconds. If you add that up, you've got a number 19. Something else very fascinating about this eclipse. It hits into what they call the cradle of the birthing place of the indigenous tribes of the Mexicans or the original uh, inhabitants who came after or with the empire of the Aztecs. And it hits in, I know that some of these names you might not know right now, but it's not important, but I think it's good to give you the information. It is the capital of the old Aztec empire, which is called Tenochtitlan. And Tenochtitlan is located on a bed of lakes that has now been filled up by debris, filling it in to build what is Mexico City. That's why that tremendous earthquake that took place on September the 19th, and I believe more earthquakes to come, hits that area so tremendously. And even the old temples and cathedrals that are in the center of the city are on the verge of collapse. And that is because the water that is below is beginning to rise. And the earth that was filling it in is beginning to sink. So Mexico is in a lot of trouble in terms of the ecological paradigms that we are now painting. It doesn't look too promising. In connection with the earthquake activity, they are also sitting on a lot of volcanic um, uh, cones or mountains. Two of the biggest ones is called Popocatepetl, which is the male gender, and its Itzlatzihuatl is supposed to represent the woman. And the saying is that when the woman awakens, just like the goddess Pele in Kilauea, in the volcano in the Hawaiian Islands, there's always the feminine gender that is given to the earth when it is in its commotion, you see, and fire. And even the Quran says that the earth would be like an abyss of fire or hell that would be produced. So Mexico City now has active volcanoes. And I think you remember that there was an eruption of a volcano called the Chicon volcano several years ago, which produced a cloud-like effect over the northern part of America, which also interfered with atmospheric uh, changes in the atmosphere. Now, there is a volcano on the western coast near the Pacific, near this place called Nayari, that's called Colima, that's in a state. That volcano, according to the scientists at UNAM, University of Mexico, they said that that volcano could erupt at any time now. And they warn, are warning the people in the Valley of Mexico that they should take precautions and that volcanoes could erupt at any time. Now, what does this mean? Why are the volcanoes spewing up and coming active after 600 years of being dormant, 200 years of being dormant? It is due to the fact that this solar eclipse is very, very unusual in other aspects. When the solar eclipse will take place this Thursday, we have come to the maximum of what they call the solar flares or sunspots on the corona of the sun, which reaches every 11 years. So we've had two 11-year periods, so the really max is 22 years. So by the summer, July, when this earth, um, volcan uh, vo uh, not volcano eclipse takes place, we will have reached the maximum of the sunspot period. And what happens is that these flares jump out millions and millions of miles, producing like a magnetic attraction on everything that it comes in contact with. So what now the volcanists and other scientists are saying is that the Activity in the sun right now is so intense that two phenomena have been studied. We used to have to go to Anchorage, Alaska to see the northern lights. But this year, we were able or are able to see the northern lights displayed as far south from Anchorage as New York State, Pennsylvania, or Colorado. 
Now that has some very serious implications. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that God would use the sun in order to work out the judgment of the world. And that when the intensity of the sun and the moon is used by God, that it will cut out communications, it will cause the blackouts and all that you've read about. And this is actually happening at an astounding rate right now, but they will not report to you what is happening. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said they will not report the truth until it is right on our heels. The second um, phenomenon to study beside the northern lights is that the volcanic eruptions, this is what has now been concluded, that the volcanic eruptions that we are witnessing is due to the fact that the sun's magnetic attraction is so powerful and so strong right now that it is actually reaching out like fingers, pulling up the molten um, uh, center core of our earth. So fire is being pulled up from the center, fire is coming down from the heavens. And this is just a sign of what is about to take place. According to the 92nd surah, which comes immediately, I didn't go to the 91st, but the 91st surah is called the sun. And if you prefix 91 by 19, we're in the year. You do that with every surah of the Quran, and you read what that surah has to say. And you will be looking at a prophetic picture of year by year by the calendar what is about to take place. Next year, 1992, go to the 92nd surah. It's called Elayl or the night. So in the night, what does that mean? And why? I'm going to combine this. Why is this shadow of the moon falling on these specific areas of the world? Let's back up to January 15th of this year, 1991. We had a partial solar eclipse in New Zealand. New Zealand on January the 15th. What happened January the 15th? War in the Persian Gulf. Now, just before we are ready to have a total eclipse, the signs and talk of war again. So, as they talk war and negotiate for war, we have to be the people of peace. While they are sending guns, making it easy for our young people to have guns, shooting each other, fighting each other, this is part of the game, and our young people have to become aware of this. It's a setup so that they can have the excuse that we're so criminally prone and that we're so dangerous, that we are shooting each other, we're killing each other, we are the dope-infested people of the community, so that our reputation around the world, so that at a moment when they want to move their national guard or make an incident to occur, they can move into the neighborhood and the world will say, well, I understand. They had guns, they were shooting each other, they were killing each other. would like to propose that we become more enlightened before we have no more light to enlighten us with. That darkness will soon come on this planet so severely, not just by an eclipse that lasts seven minutes, but the sign of that eclipse is the breaking away and the destruction of an old world order and the coming in of a new world order. Because the moon, as it covers the face of the sun is a new crescent moon. And that new crescent moon is the sign and the flag of Islam that Master Farad Muhammad gave to us on national, the sun, the moon, and the star, to show the world that a new nation was rising up in the West. And so this eclipse is in the West, is that right? from the western part of Hawaii where the indigenous people are of the black original people. The original Hawaiians are black. The original Samoans are black. The original Polynesians and Samoa, all of
of the people are black. And then later migrations of others came and mixed with the original inhabitants, so now they call themselves Polynesians. But under Polynesia is our black mothers and our black fathers because we are the mothers and the fathers of all the races on this planet. So there are two things that we have warned about with this coming eclipse. That because we are the rising new nation and the old world knows that it is being eclipsed, and when I say that it knows it's being eclipsed, yes, I love the Native American and their ceremonies. Yes, I love the Mexican people and their ceremonies because they are trying to purify themselves. But that is not the civilization that Almighty God Allah is about to bring into existence. But by knowing the people and their language, by knowing our people in Mexico, Latin America, by knowing our people in the South Pacific, then we are able to unite as one, regardless to what they practice or what they preach. We have the knowledge and the key that is going to open the heavens and is going to open the door to a new world civilization that is about to come into being. So that eclipse is not just the eclipsing of the old world and the Bush administration or the Western civilization, but it is also an eclipse of the old world religions. All of them. All of them. Even the eclipse, as we read in Balad, of the old world of Islam. Not because God does not love you and not that he didn't give the Arab the way to show in the ceremony. But when God comes, he says, I make all things new. So in the darkness, there is the light of a new world order that is getting ready to rise like the midday sun. And this eclipse comes exactly at midday in Mexico. So that suddenly, when it appears to be light, gradually it will get dark and the sun will not give its light. And you will be able to look up and you will see stars, you'll be able to see the planet Venus, you'll be able to see Mars if you're able to track them, because they're very prominent on the horizon at this time. Jupiter and Mercury, Regulus, one of the stars in the constellation, and many other beautiful things to show you that these are signs of what our fathers created to keep the world moving on time. We created these cycles. We created the moon, didn't we? And the moon is talking back to us, isn't it? Because that was a destructive thought that put the wonder of the moon. And the first landing on the moon in 1969, count it up. The moon is talking back to those who try to put their hypocritical foot on top of part of our earth. When they did that, it was called the Apollo 11. Is that right? And Neil Armstrong sent back word and they snapped snapshots, did you know, of objects that were trailing them, following them, as they put their first foot and landed on the moon. So now, in 1952, listen to this, July the 19th, several objects appeared for several objects over the White House. And they sent up their, their airplanes to try to intercept, and they were not able to find them. And one week later, on July 26, there appeared other objects, again, bright lights over the White House in 1952. So as we study the phenomenon of what is going on in the heavens above and in the earth below, and we see and study and measure the world events, do we not know that a mighty hand is upon us? Do we not have faith that God will deliver us out of this tribulation hour? 
Second sign that we have to be warned of. There will be a move by some reckless, careless man or woman or group right in our midst and outside of our group who through their ignorance and through their evil may have the thought that they would like to get rid of God's warner in our midst, Minister Louis Farrakhan. But let me say this and take it to heart. This is the pattern that has always been in a wicked world where God has sent his servants. It's not unusual. It is something that we should expect because we're surrounded by demons. Black demons, white demons, yellow demons, any color. So God says in the Bible, watch as well as pray. Because we know not the hour that this great end of the judgment will come. But he gives us signs to study. He gives us signs in the earth and in the heavens above to make it so clear that none of us can err. We know the handwriting is on the wall and we have but a short time. May God choose us to take us out of this tribulation period because the destruction is going on all around us. And this is exactly what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. But the angels are also working among us. And they know what we are doing, where we are, and how to contact us. But we have to be alert and we have to be ready. Final word, the problem book gives us a description of a square that is ultimately cubed. And this square that is ultimately cubed has a certain weight. This weight is 1,728 cubic inches equals one foot weighs something. It weighs 62 and one half pounds. Now, what am I talking about? Muhammad, after he completed his mission, after he received the revelation of the Quran and taught his community both in Mecca and in Medina, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that he was 62 and a half years when he died. We are 61 years into the mission. Is that right? 62 and a half would run into the, what we call the quincentennial centennial celebration of the discovery of America or so-called discovery of America by Columbus. Is that right? So the work of Muhammad is expanding in the night. 92, a light, is expanding to encompass all of our people of the Western Hemisphere, from Canada to Alaska, all the way out into the South Pacific, down into Mexico, Central America, and South America. We are the people that God is calling on to stand up and to unite. Because out of us, the black, the red, the Indian, which is not a good word, but Native American, the Mexican, the Latino, the West Indian, all of our people, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that he was going to unite. And we are the nucleus of that unification. So we have to be right. So, wait. If we are to survive, obesity and fat has got to go. And it is no laughing matter because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that we will be given in our taking away, on our escape, we will be given only three cubic inches of air space to breathe, cubic inches. 
And that when we are rescued, if you are overweight, that there will be certain soldiers or persons who would take you to a little hatch. I'm talking about planes now. And they would open it up and out you would go. That's hard, isn't it? Yep, that's very hard. And do you know what the weight was that we used to have to weigh in at? 122 <laughs> pounds. And depending on the frame and the structure, 128, but not over. We had to be in the 120 mark. And that was to save our life. That's what the bottom line of the fat problem that we have developed in our communities is all about. We will not be acceptable by God. So look how magnificently, if you study the pattern of the revelations that he has received to guide us through, he has not missed one moment on the prophecy, has he? Because if 62 and a half weight equals next year, and he's given us six months, is that right? And some a year. We're right in the edge of time, standing on a pit of fire, that we can work with each other and come out of this alive. So brothers and sisters, I love you. You're beautiful. You have been very attentive. And I really hope that I have enlightened you in some manner about the tremendous time that we are in and that you will look at the eclipse coming up on July the 11th, not simply as a physical occurrence that repeats itself after so many and so many years, but in it we will have a time for reflection, a time for renewal, and a time for the spiritual ingestion of its fullest meaning, the rise of you and I to become the new world leaders and rulers of the vast ocean of people beginning right here in America and encompassing all of our people of the Western Hemisphere. This is a great blessing that has been offered to you and I. And I pray Allah that we will live up to it and love one another and act respectful to one another and speak to one another as if you were speaking to God. Every time you look at a black brother and a black sister, you're looking into the face of God. And if you're looking into the face of God, then we've got to act like it. It is my prayer that all of us will be counted in among that number when the saints go marching in. May Allah bless you and keep you, take care of you and me until we meet again. I salam alaikum. Let us give Sister Tainetta Muhammad another round of applause. Show our love and gratefulness. Brothers and sisters, I pray Allah that what you heard from Sister Tainetta Muhammad helped you in enabling you to see the critical hour that we live in. You know, one comment, brothers and sisters, you have to know that we have to be forever thankful to Allah for raising up men and women of our family that will warn us and tell us clearly the hour that we're living in. White people are talking about what's happening up there and down here and over there all the time. They constantly are warning their people of what's about to go down. But you and I 
We hear these things, but we don't pay attention to them. But better yet, they don't warn us of what's about to take place. And as we say over and over again, they're not going to tell you until it's all the way up to your door. Then they'll tell you how serious the time really is. So I appeal to you that even though you may have listened to a message that was very scientific, which it was, very mathematical, which it was, but it's history, it's mathematics, it's what you and I need. We need to study history. We need to study mathematics. We need to study and know what is going on. There are some serious events that are taking place, brothers and sisters. And the warning that we hear coming from our leader, Minister Louis Farrakhan, and the warning that we hear from the message from Sister Tainetta Mohammed is that we really don't have too much time. The time that we know now will soon be no more. We can't take for granted anymore the messages and the warnings that we're receiving. Every message that Minister Farrakhan has delivered this year is so timely, brothers and sisters, and it means that something major is about to take place. It is a universal change. And what Sister Muhammad was giving us is what sometimes we ask for, signs. Tell me what time it is. Show me how serious the time is. Well, she has given to us today events that are taking place that if we're wise, we will pay attention to them, understand them, and act accordingly. The latest issue of the final call, Minister Farrakhan asked nation to fight obesity, fact. And as I have said, don't take it personally. That man loves you and I more than you love yourself. And if he's giving us this warning, it means something is about to take place where fact and the, and the force of gravity will pull extra weight down and you will not be able to move or survive in the times that are about to come up. This is a serious hour, brother, a serious hour, sister. And Muhammad has told you what will take place and he has given you the time and what must be done. So at this time, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I want to ask you that after hearing the message today from our beloved sister, Tainetta Mohammed, how many of you believe that what you heard was the truth and is good for black people? Can I see your hands? All praises due to Allah. Beautiful black hands. And now I would like to ask you, those of you who are here for your first, second, or third time, or are visiting on your 10th occasion, and have not yet made that bold step, how many of you want to begin to change your lives for the better, come and accept your own and be yourself, and walk behind the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Can I please see 
your beautiful black hand. Brothers and sisters, all praises. Can you stand up? Stand up, brothers, sisters, those of you who raised your hands. I would like my mother, Sister Tainetta Mohammed, to have, if she would please be so kind, to shake your hand. Brothers, please stand up. I want you to come out here. Sisters, please come here. Sisters, right here. Bro sisters and brothers, just come right down the aisle here. Come right on out. Don't be shy. This is not a time for us to be bashful. All the sisters, brothers, just line right on up. Would like my mother, sister Tainetta Mohammed, to shake your hand. You'll be given you'll be given a pledge card, which do you uh, have they been passed? Do we have them? Please read it, fill it out, uh, sign your name, put your address, and turn it in to the secretary on your way out. And brothers, you can begin tomorrow evening at 7.30, begins the orientation class, process class, and that is the class of the FOI and of the men and sisters. Saturday at 9 a.m. You may return for orientation. So at this time, I would like Sister Muhammad to shake your hand and welcome you to the Nation of Islam. Let's give them a round of applause, brothers and sisters. All praise is due to Allah. Our brothers and sisters joining on to their own kind. All praises due to Allah. Give them a better round of applause than that, brothers and sisters. All praises due to Allah. All praises due to Allah. Brothers and sisters, again, I personally would want to thank my mother for uh, under the circumstances. I mean, I literally begged her to speak today. I, I had a lot to say as I've been getting long in my speeches lately. Not that long, maybe 15, 20 minutes. But I wanted you to hear what she had to say today because it's so timely. And um, if you didn't understand everything that she said, please get the tape, take it home and study it because it's a lot, a lot of wisdom in it. I know personally I have to do that because there's not a speech that my mother gives that I can really uh, get all of the understanding live. I got to go get the tape and study and replay it over and over to extract all of the knowledge that is in it. So I personally want to thank you, Mom, for being here. And I know 